So could it be food? So this topic I really feel was sparked um, for me when I had patients coming in and saying, my, you know, my health or my symptoms improved when I followed X, Y, or Z diet. And, you know, often people will come in with a restrictive dietary change, you know, think about all of the messages that we're getting from, you know, different authors and, you know, media um, about Whole30 diet and other restrictive diets. And what's interesting is people are finding that some symptoms, you know, and you can fill in the blank, headaches, stomach upset, joint pain improved when I removed something from my diet. And so we're gonna explore why that might be today because there's lots of different reasons why that could be. And this is, these are the messages that we're getting from all different um, places. These are some famous books that are out that are um, promoting restrictive kind of diets. And I think the point that I would like to make the most is that it's different for everybody. So whereas for your friend, maybe the whole 30 was life changing, you know, for you, maybe that's not the case. And it's because we all come to the table with a unique set of factors. And sometimes, you know, what works for one person may not work for the next. So food, in the most basic sense, comes in and becomes part of us, but it is under the supervision of the immune system. So everybody's heard of, you are what you eat, <laughs> and, and that's true. It's just under that supervision of the immune system. The immune system's job is to determine friend or enemy, and at least three times a day, we're putting food into our body, and our immune system, which is heavily associated with the gastrointestinal system, has to decide, is this a friend or an enemy? And in some cases, even though it's just, say, an apple, um, biological alarms will sound in the gut and an inflammatory response occurs. And this can lead to inflammation. And a big point to make is that inflammation in the gut can lead to inflammation in other places. So if we eat a food that for whatever reason, and we'll talk about why some of those reasons are, the immune system reacts to, we can get gut inflammation and then inflammation messaging to other places in the body. So not all symptoms of a food reaction are gastrointestinal, which is why, you know, sometimes with headaches or joint issues or other even rashes and other things, we might consider foods as a possible um, factor. So this is, these are the different kinds of food reactions that you can get. So, and this I find helpful because it just, um, kind of separates out what kinds of reactions there are. So the classical IgE immune reaction is that classic allergy. You know, so we've all heard of food allergies where people will get hives and trouble breathing, um, you know, in, this, in the most severe sense for anaphylaxis. And that's not really what I'm gonna focus on today. I'm gonna focus more so on some of those other kinds of food reactions that are maybe not as dramatic and a little more subtle. Then there's these IgG or IgA food reactions. And think of this as just another branch of the immune system reacting. So if, you know, think about our armed forces, how we're, it's divided into Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, our immune system is divided into different um, sort of categories as well. And these IgG or IgA reactions are, are, based, are called non-IgE reactions. And so, and they're more subtle. Um, you know, they can include things like headaches, stomach upset, um, in some, some um, um, to some degree, as well as even rashes um, and other things. And then there's white blood cell reactions where there's a big immune response. And, and I'll talk about this in the case of celiac disease. <clears throat> 
And so those are the major classes where your immune system is reaction, reacting. There's also non-immune system reaction. Um, so think about this as, say, someone with like lactose intolerance that they have trouble metabolizing a sugar in dairy or in food. Um, and in that case, that's a, a metabolic or metabolism problem. And then there's also reactions, toxic um, components of food. So think about things like mercury in fish or um, you know, mold on peanuts. And I think this is more common than we actually um, realize. So if we look at the data on adults with food allergy, it's really only two to three percent. So that's that classic IgE reaction that I was telling you about. And then adults with intolerance is measured at seven to eight percent. And I think that that's probably a lot higher. And celiac, which is a um, a immune reaction to gluten specifically, 1%. But yet one third of the population avoid a specific food due to a reaction. And I really do feel like a lot of people, um, it's a non-IgE or immune um, intolerance to a food. So food allergy, this is that, that classic um, immune response to food. And we say it's IgE mediated. So that's the branch of the immune system that's reacting. It's that classic allergy. And anything other than that is considered non-IgE in conventional circles. In functional medicine model, we refer to that as a food sensitivity. I just want to clarify because not all conventional doctors will know what you're talking about if you say like food sensitivity, but they would know if you say it's a non-IgE immune reaction um, because it's the nomenclature is not um, fully accepted. Um, and then there's the white blood cell reaction, which we'll talk about in the case of celiac. And sometimes you can get a mix of all of them. So when we think about that IgE or classic allergy, um, you know, most of the time we're thinking about respiratory symptoms, anything from mild asthma to severe throat closing anaphylaxis type reactions. And you can get gastrointestinal food allergies. I have seen this before. Um, and a lot of times it's immediate and usually it's vomiting. Um, and sometimes it can be delayed. And what's interesting is sometimes it, it only occurs when there's combinations of foods. So say um, I, I once had a patient who had um, a wheat allergy, but only when he drank wine. <laughs> And, you know, of course, wine and bread go together. But it happened to be that when he um, drank the wine, it kind of irritated his, his um, gut. And that's when he reacted to, um, to the um, wheat. And then there's, of course, skin reactions, hives, um, and even eczema. Eczema tends to be a mixed response, um, so, but, but IgE often is um, part of that. So really, you know, if, if, there's, if I suspect that there's a food classic allergy, um, you know, I would consider doing a blood test to look to see if the person has um, an IgE response. This is also the skin prick test that you've probably heard about um, um, that some people will get to test for allergies. And then the IgE allergy is fast. So basically we have these mast cells in our body and the mast cells get sensitized um, to the allergen every time we eat it. And they, it kind of um, sits there waiting. And then the next time we introduce that, that food, um, the mast cell releases histamine. I think of it like, like a cell waiting to sneeze um, and the histamine gets released and that's what causes the symptoms. And then food sensitivity, which is that non-IgE, the different branches of the immune system reacting, they tend to be more slow um, and they tend to be more chronic and gastrointestinal symptoms tend to meet, um, be more common. So these reactions are way more subtle 
And so it's really hard to know, especially when you're having a meal with all sorts of foods mixed in, if you're getting a reaction from the, the food or you know, from a specific food. Um, the half-life of the reaction is about 21 days as compared to just a couple days with the other um, IgE kind of reaction. And this is why, and, and I know there's some of you on the call today that have done this, this is why we do three weeks of an elimination diet so that we can figure out, you know, if a food um, is, you know, triggering a non-IgE or food sensitivity response. And then the food intolerance, that's what I'll refer to as some of those other things that I was mentioning, like metabolic, like lactose intolerance, or some people are intolerant to the fermentable foods for a variety of reasons that we'll talk a little teeny bit about. Um, but anyway, they have trouble metabolizing sugars in foods, and you can get a non-immunologic reaction that way. Um, and those tend to be um, gastrointestinal. And then pharmacologic, you know, so I think about um, components of food like caffeine. So I have some patients who are very sensitive to caffeine and that's an issue for them. And, you know, that's really a metabolism issue. So they have trouble metabolizing the component, um, you know, as well, uh, the, uh, or detoxing it, the caffeine. Um, and then toxic, like I mentioned. And then there's all sorts of other food intolerances. You know, I have some patients who are histamine intolerant or intolerant to sulfites. Um, and again, this is all very personalized and individual um, you know, because what, 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 what affects one person does not affect everybody. So when we go to test for immune system reactions, um, really, and this is in conventional circles as well as functional medicine circles, um, you know, as far as medical opinion goes, the gold standard is an elimination diet with a double blind oral food challenge. So that means that um, you don't know, you know what food um, is being reintroduced or in introduced after the elimination. Um, and, that, and that's really hard to do because obviously, you know, it's hard to blind yourself to tasting, say, you know, blueberries or, or you know, wheat or, you know, so it's, that's the gold standard though. Um, the skin prick test, so you've heard of allergy testing that way, is useful, but again, not diagnostic, it's not 100%. And same for the blood tests as well. Um, you know, the IgE blood testing is useful, but not 100%. And, and so I always, you know, sort of take the results of these tests, you know, and filter them through the patient's symptoms. <laughs> so it's very important, you know, not to kind of take them blindly. And then elimination of one or a few specific foods may be useful, in a, and especially for the non-IgE because that's harder to diagnose. And then I have found, and I use these in my practice, um, although they're not um, universally accepted in um, conventional uh, medicine, these IgG um, blood, blood testing, um, and that's to test for those food sensitivities that are more subtle. And again, they're useful, but not diagnostic. So they're never 100%. You know, I often see patients who've had, you know, food sensitivity testing from a couple years ago, and they're still not eating those foods. Um, and it's important to, you know, re-challenge those now and again, um, you know, because I, I do feel like those can change over time. So this is the classic allergy reaction. So food allergens, this is our gut wall. These are the cells of the gut. Um, and these little cilia um, indicate the inside of the gut lining. When we eat the food, the food out, what, what our body is um, reacting to, the food allergens come in. We have these immune cells that present the allergen to our white blood cells, which then the white blood cells end up releasing these inflammatory proteins that these interleukin 9, 13, 5, and 4. And then that causes um, basically a sensitization of those mast cells that I was telling you about, which um, once they're sensitized with the allergen, the next time the allergen comes through our gut or our system, the mast cell will release 
the histamine, and um, and then that causes that classic IgE reaction um, or that allergy. And sometimes, you know, it's not necessarily full-on anaphylaxis. There can be, um, you know, less than that. So people with asthma or people with eczema, you know, I often find that this um, kind of IgE allergy testing can be helpful. And I think it's important to note, especially this time of year with allergy season, that the release of histamine, which our body releases in response to allergens, be it food or be it um, environmental pollens and dust and things like that, has a lot of effects in the body. You know, it increases inflammatory proteins, it can affect our stomach acid, it elevates our blood pressure, it increases our heart rate, and maybe, you know, sometimes can even affect the breathing, blood clotting, and even our neurotransmitters. So so it's important to note that, you know, even if I have a patient who has kind of chronic inflammation and I know that they have seasonal allergies, I'm always thinking, well, what can I do, you know, to help offset that? Because it does have downstream effects in the body in other areas. The other thing that I just always like to mention, because I, I feel like these acid blocking medicines are a big part of some people's um, increased tendency toward food allergies. And what's interesting is blocking the acid in the stomach increases your risk of having food reaction. So in a small study that they did, they took 150 patients and they did the IgE or food allergy testing before and then after three months of acid blocking therapy. So that would be like your purple pill, like your, um, your um, Nexium and Prilosec and um, Pepsid or Zantac. Um, and then they saw that there was a 10% of the patients showed a boost in the allergic antibodies, um, which I think is interesting. So they had them previously, but then it, it, it um, happened even greater to a greater degree. And then 15% had new allergies or IgE reactions to a variety of uh, foods. And so that could be things like, um, and this was in this particular study, milk, potatoes, celery, carrots, apple, orange, wheat, and rye. So people who didn't even have an allergy um, developed one. I'm gonna take a, a break for a second. I'm gonna stop share because I think we have some questions. I'm gonna open the chat. All right. On the half-life for an IgE reaction, is the two to three days the amount of time it takes for half the histamine to go away? Yeah, so for half of the immunoglobulins and the histamine, um, yes, that would, that would be correct. And I get nosebleeds when I eat dark chocolate. Would this be considered an IgE or an IgG? I think... Um, that's a tough one. I think I would lean toward an IgE um, because of, you know, I think histamine could do that, um, but I'm not 100% sure of that, um, but I would lean toward the IgE. I can get back to you, um, Diane, uh, with that, the answer to that. I'll, I'll take a look and see if I can find the answer. Any other questions while I have the screen share off before I go back to the screen share? All right, let me go back and share. Okie doke. And this is um, just showing that low stomach acid and, and food allergy. Um, so low stomach acid, which happens when we block <laughs> the acid in the stomach, um, it increases the risk of a food allergy because basically you're not breaking up the food. So in the case of um, low stomach acid, we are just, you know, the food is remaining more intact and, um, and that can lead to um, the immune system reacting to it in that way. And I would also say that, you know, low stomach acid can occur not just from taking medicines to block stomach acid, Sometimes 
low stomach acid is just, you know, from as we age, we have a less stomach acid that is produced um, in some people, as well as when we eat when we're stressed, um, that, you know, we will have less stomach acid that is produced if we're eating and when we're in fight or flight when the sympathetic nervous system is in overdrive, there will be less digestive juices produced and you have more likely um, a chance of having food reaction. So again, with the allergies, the IgE reactions, food elimination and challenge is the gold standard. We don't really rely on skin prick testing for food allergy, and then we don't rely on the um, blood tests alone. It's always in the context of the patient's symptoms. Um, it is well standardized, but it doesn't always correlate with what's happening in the body. Um, and so we have to pay attention, you know, that it's not set in stone if you test positive on an IgE, but yet when you eat it, you feel fine. Um, we have to pay attention to that. And usually when you get the food allergy testing, um, it'll grade it. So there'll be different grades of reactivity. And the higher the grade that you score, the more likely it is that you will react when you eat that food. So I always feel like when, you know, when I suspect, um, the other kind of immune reaction or the um, food sensitivities, you know, these are the symptoms that I tend to sort of um, think about, start thinking about, could this be a food? Um, so irritable bowel, constipation, diarrhea, and reflux, those are pretty common. And I often will think, could this be a food reaction, um, you know, in, in those circumstances? Eczema, I'll think about it for, for I, for non-IgE as well as for IgE um, and odd rashes of all kinds. So I've seen um, a whole host of different rashes that responded to a food um, or elimination diet. And, um, and I do think a lot of times that has to do with um, improving the gut barrier, which I'll talk about in a moment. Headaches, joint pain, mood disorders, autoimmune conditions of all kinds, and then inflammatory conditions of all kinds. So, so pretty much, you know, um, any kind of immune hyperreactivity, which I would classify as autoimmune or just inflammatory in general, I'll start thinking about, you know, could, could food be a factor here? I never think it's the only thing, but a lot of times I'll just, you know, it'll, um, come to mind that maybe we should be looking for that. So how far have we come? All disease starts in the gut, Hippocrates at 400 BC. And the gut is not like, like, like Las Vegas. What happens in the gut does not stay in the gut. And this was 2014, Dr. Faisano, who's an expert on gluten-related um, disorders. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how our gut health influences that immune um, reaction that can happen in the gut, making it more or, or less likely um, to have a reaction to food. So this is our gut, and this is the gut wall, and the cells of the gut wall are held together by these little tiny tight junctions where I have my cursor, hopefully which you can see. Um, and this is the gut lumen. So when food goes down, it gets broken up into particles, as well as there's bacteria and all sorts of things inside the gut, um, the gut um, tube. And typically it stays there, you know, until, until our body is like, okay, I'm, I need, you know, these amino acids or this protein. And, and typically it goes through the cell and um, into that gut blood, um, gut blood connection. What happens in a lot of cases when there is some inflammation in the gut, and that could be related to either medications or imbalances of the gut bacteria, those tight junctions won't be so tight. And what will happen is um, the immune cells, which you could see that these little Y-shaped little red things in here, um, will actually it kind of go back and forth with the gut lumen and your immune system will be reacting to everything it's seeing in the gut um, tube. And when that happens, we say that this is leaky gut or increased intestinal permeability. And really what, it's, what it is, is that your immune system is constantly sampling what's in that gut tube. 
And if so, it's more likely to mount a reaction to components of food. And that's where we get some non-IgE um, immune reactions. I'm gonna stop share and just make sure that there's, see if there's any questions. So regarding gluten sensitivity, can this become celiac at some point, even the slightest amount causes reactions? We're gonna talk about um, celiac disease and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, for people who have the gene for celiac, um, then yes, <laughs> it is possible that um, you can develop celiac disease at some point. If you do not have the gene for celiac, because it's, it's basically a genetic predisposition that doesn't always um, express. <laughs> and so, so if you don't have the gene, there's no way you can get celiac. How do they test for leaky gut? So typically we test for leaky gut a number of ways. One way is a stool test, which often will show signs of leaky gut. So sometimes there will be um, you know, um, signs of immunoglobulins in the stool, which really shouldn't be, as well as some inflammatory markers in the stool, which again, really shouldn't be. And so that's one way. Um, another way are blood tests for zonulin. Zonulin is a protein that gets released um, when the cells of the gut lining kind of are, are more open. Um, and it, it basically, zonulin kind of opens up the cells. So those tight junctions, um, zonulin is a protein that's produced and it kind of opens up those tight junctions. Um, and so when there's high amounts of that that zonulin, um, then we know that there's probably leaky gut. Um, so there's some nice labs that um, there's a um, vibrant lab that, that um, has a nice test called the intestinal permeability panel. And I like to order that periodically um, and in the case of leaky gut, just to kind of see where we're at um, for myself and, and for patients. Other questions before I go into the share? All right, go back to sharing my screen again. Okay, so I love this little diagram um, because it really just draws a connection between um, food sensitivity and imbalanced gut bacteria and that leaky gut. So, you know, and, and I always think, you know, I always wonder, like, what comes first? You know, what's the first... Um, you know, sort of break in this cycle. Because I have some patients who, you know, basically since birth, you know, have had gut issues. And I often think, all right, well that, they have a food sensitivity perhaps that is, you know, creating an imbalanced gut bacteria. And then that compromises the gut wall. Um, so that, that leaky gut or that increased intestinal permeability, there's that influx of food components and microbes and then the immune system gets mad. So inflammation happens, the immune system reacts, and then a food sensitivity develops. And sometimes I feel like first the imbalanced gut bacteria happens, um, you know, and, and that kind of sets off this whole pattern that, you know, perhaps, you know, after a whole slew of antibiotics and steroids and um, ibuprofen, um, there was an imbalance of the gut bacteria. And then again, compromise of the gut wall and, you know, the, the process ensues. And then that results in food sensitivity merely because you know, the imbalance of the gut bacteria happened first. So sometimes we don't know, you know, which came first, but what I do know <laughs> is that if I improve the gut bacteria, I improve the integrity of the gut wall, um, I, and I, I reduce inflammation or the reactivity of the immune system, um, I do know that food sensitivities improve. Um, you know, I've seen that. I've seen that happen. Um, and so, I, you know, that's usually where I start and I try to hit um, different areas of this diagram. That was my little arrow to show. I start with imbalanced gut bacteria sometimes. Um, the IgG food sensitivity testing, again, this is not widely accepted by allergists, um, but having used them for many years, I do feel like they're helpful 
part of why they're not fully accepted is because there's no standardization of the antigens. Um, so, you know, cooked versus raw, you know, it's really um, not standardized from lab to lab. Um, the studies are mixed, I think, for that very reason. And so I find it not diagnostic, but very clinically useful sometimes. So if I have somebody who's had an IgG food sensitivity test, and let's just say, um, you know, dairy, you know, and the proteins in dairy lit up on that, um, you know, what I'll do is I'll remove the food for a period of time, you know, that minimum of like three to four weeks. Um, and then, you know, I'll try to reintroduce it. So the, um, the National um, um, Immunology and Allergy um, Infectious Disease Association does not recommend the IgG food sensitivity testing. However, you know, like I said, you know, I find it very useful because sometimes it's really hard to tell after an elimination diet. And sometimes we don't eliminate all the possible foods that you could be reacting to. Um, you know, we try to eliminate the usual suspect foods, gluten, dairy, corn, soy, peanuts, um, you know, but, um, you know, could, it could be peppers or apple or, you know, that there's so many other foods that it could be. Um, and so sometimes I do find this helpful. And once, you know, you find, like I've found some labs that I've trusted and I've seen where people have improved. Um, and then I'll always after, especially after I've done some gut repair, I will always try to reintroduce um, the food after a period of time because the goal is never to be on a restrictive diet forever. So when I suspect an, um, an IgE non-anaphylactic or an, a non-IgE food reaction, um, I, you know, obviously I take a careful history and then we consider an elimination diet of the usual foods, gluten, dairy, corn, soy, peanuts, eggs, shellfish. Um, and then typically we will reintroduce the foods after about three or four weeks um, every three days. And then, then I usually will consider some IgE testing or IgG testing. Sometimes I see patients who've kind of done all this or, you know, have um, already been on elimination diets and, and they're not sure. And so sometimes I will do it sooner. Um, but I always try to do some gut repair first because I do feel like the results improve the more I can heal that gut lining. So this is the um, Allergy, Asthma, and Immunolo Immun Immunology Academy. Um, if clinical history is not consistent with anaphylaxis, perform a graded oral food challenge to rule out food allergy. Um, open food challenge is both cost effective and time efficient. So this is just to say like, none of the tests are 100% and always removing the food and adding it in as long as the person doesn't have anaphylaxis. Obviously, we wouldn't want to do that um, you know, if they, if they had anaphylaxis. And then manage the non-IgE mediated reactions to foods with avoidance and pharmacotherapy as indicated with the understanding that the specific role of immunity in these forms of food allergy has not been demonstrated. So conventional um, immunologists and allergists will recognize that there is this non-IgE mediated reaction, which I am calling food sensitivity, because that's what we call it in functional medicine. Um, so, that, so they recognize that it's there. It's just the controversy comes around the testing um, and, and the significance. However, in my experience, I have found it to be very clinically significant for some patients. So this, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, the, two, the gut tube, single cell layer thick, and it's connected to every area of the body. And that's why when there's inflammation in the gut and the immune system is mad inside the gut, you can get symptoms in other areas, which can lead to chronic inflammation. What happens in the gut doesn't stay in the gut. And so I am going to just move on to gut-related disorders. I'm going to stop share for a second, see if there's some questions. So when are fecal transplants recommended for se severe gut imbalances? Another really controversial area. <laughs> so right now, um, fecal transplant is only um, recommended for um, like the severe infections like C. diff. So, you know, do I think that this is a huge area of study? Um, and I, I think it's, um, 
I, I guess what, what my concern is, <laughs> is that because we know the gut bacteria is so intimately connected to a whole host of um, conditions, and anyone who's had a stool test in my practice knows that, you know, there are associations between some bacteria and some medical conditions, and it's very specific. So we're learning that certain bacteria increase your risk of say diabetes or mood disorder or other things doesn't mean that you're definitely going to have that if you have that particular bacteria in your gut but it just increases your risk so my worry is you know as we sort of look at fecal transplants for weight loss and for other things you know from healthy donors um you know, I just wonder, you know, will the recipient of the fecal transplant get some of this, the other conditions that the donor had, you know, so say the donor, you know, even though they're healthy, you know, ha has um, a certain bacteria um, or, or have a mood disorder or whatever, you know, could that, um, you know, get um, relayed to the recipient? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, um, but it is under this is a huge area of study um, for everything from everything from weight loss to um, autoimmune conditions. Um, but really, the only bona fide um, recommendation is for um, C. diff that has not responded to antibiotics. Any other questions? Okay. Let me share screen again. Now we're going to talk about gluten because I feel like. Gluten, um, if I had to pick, <laughs> is probably one of the um, most common food um, restrictions that, you know, people will find, oh gosh, you know, I removed gluten and X or Y got better. And so we'll talk about the spectrum of gluten-related disorders. So gluten is the protein in wheat, barley, and rye. And there's other peptides or proteins in gluten. Um, so there's gliadins and glutenins. And so gluten is just the most famous <laughs> structural protein in wheat. Um, and celiac disease is not a straight up gluten allergy. It's um, a non-IgE mediated immune response and it's a cellular response. So basically what happens is it's an autoimmune condition. So it's kind of a mixed reaction. So gluten is the trigger and it triggers the immune system to attack the lining of the gut. And so it's an autoimmune condition. It's not an allergy or straight up reaction like that. The symptoms can be intestinal or and they can be extra intestinal. And I think about this for all of my autoimmune patients, um, because if you have one autoimmune condition, you are more likely to have another. And I often will, you know, diagnose celiac disease, you know, not from intestinal kinds of symptoms, but because the person is presenting with some other autoimmune condition. I would say most of the cases that I've had in the past, you know, couple of years have been triggered triggered testing because of not gut stuff. Um, it was always immune system stuff that, you know, sort of um, made me want to test for, test for it. So celiac disease is, is a white blood cell mediated autoimmune reaction triggered by gluten. I wish we knew the triggers for all autoimmune conditions, but what's cool about celiac is that it is an autoimmune condition for which we know the trigger. So we can, um, so it's not out of the realm of possibility that other autoimmune conditions, you know, think Hashimoto's, think, um, you know, Sjogren's or rheumatoid or, you know, any other autoimmune condition could be triggered by a food. Um, so I, I just think it's an interesting model for that. So antibodies against enzymes in the wall of the gut leads to damage and atrophy of the gut. So remember how I showed you the, um, the cells of the gut lining were sort of like little, they had little cilia or these little um, hairs in the inside of the gut lining. In celiac, um, it's kind of flattened. And so if it's more like shag carpet in a normal person, it's like Berber carpet in somebody with celiac. And then 25% of celiac patients have other autoimmune conditions. And like I said, sometimes I find those other autoimmune conditions, and then we find celiac um, disease as an after, after um, thought. <laughs> 
So what happens in celiac is, you know, as gluten, these, this is this little kidney bean thing is a gluten protein. It kind of comes through the gut. Remember we saw like it can kind of come through the cells because um, gluten is a hard protein to go through the cell. So the gut and everybody, everyone who eats gluten, the cells of the gut lining have to open up a teeny bit, you know, to let the gluten proteins in. And then that stimulates these interleukins, which are inflammatory chemicals. Um, and that sends a message to people who genetically, to these antigen presenting cells, genetically have um, this DQ2 or 8. So that's the gene for celiac. So people who have these kinds of immune cells in their system um, will be the only ones that react in this way. And like I said, that's, that's genetically um, determined. And what happens then is white blood cells will sort of become activated to attack that gut lining. And that's what's happening in celiac. So, you know, a lot of times we're talking about, you know, how this, you know, and I hear people say this all the time, you know, wheat, wheat never used to be an issue. <laughs> you know, it's, it seems like everybody is sensitive or has celiac these days. Um, so is the, is in, celiac incidence higher than it was before? It is, it does seem to be a little bit. Um, when they've looked at um, blood samples, you know, from, you know, 30 years ago, um, it, they actually have seen that there are more, um, um, immunoglobulins um, consistent with celiac in modern blood as compared to, um, you know, um, blood from, from many years ago. And so I just think it's um, interesting that more of our um, bodies are reacting to wheat or gluten in this way. Um, and, and then, you know, I do think that there's a higher... Um, uh, food allergy in general, um, and I and I'll you know I think it's in part due to um, increased intestinal permeability and some of the things that we've been talking about today. So specifically for celiac, you know the genetics are a big part of it, but that has not changed. I mean, so so if we look at our genes from 30 years ago or 40 years ago, like those have not changed. It's too short of a time. Evolution doesn't happen that quickly. But what has changed is the gluten. You know, so people say, oh, you know, the gluten is genetically modified. And then commercial farming changes, the percentage of gluten in the grain actually is more. So, so the grain of today contains more gluten, which makes our bread like more chewy and, um, 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 you know, just more fluffier. Um, and so, that, so they think that that could be part of why this is. Um, and then there's the whole environmental piece. You know, I do think you know, lifestyle and the environment has changed. Our gut bacteria is probably different. There's higher C-section rates. There's the hygiene hypothesis where we're, you know, we're sort of um, sanitizing everything so that our gut bacteria, you know, isn't the same. And then of course, antibiotics. Um, I also should mention when I say the gluten is different, um, the role of glyphosate, you know, which is, um, you know, like Roundup, which, you know, are, are in conventional uh, farming, um, you know, fields are sprayed, wheat fields are sprayed with that. And so, you know, one of the reasons why, um, you know, is speculated that gluten is more of an issue these days is because glyphosate is attached to it, which is then recognized as our body, um, by our body as um, something foreign and something that um, the immune system reacts to. So celiac testing, you know, the blood testing is very good. You know, we test for antibodies, but biopsy is the gold standard. Whenever I have somebody who tests positive on the antibodies, it's, it's something like 98%, you know, um, predictive, but I usually will still send to GI, you know, to just um, give the final um, blessing diagnosis that yes, this is definitely celiac. Um, false negatives are possible, but it's rare. And then the genetic testing, the DQ2 and 8, is helpful sometimes um, if, you know, especially if like there's a family history and, you know, um, sometimes I will do the genetic testing, you know, especially if the person's not eating gluten because they react. And then we kind of want to see if they have the gene, um, you know, because they don't want to eat gluten again, you know, but it would be helpful to know if they are susceptible, you know, to celiac. And then in order to, you know, to see the effects on a 
biopsy, three grams per day, you have to eat gluten prior to the testing um, for antibody or for the biopsy. So some patients, because they felt so terrible when they were eating gluten, will not want to do this. <laughs> and so then I sometimes will do the test, the genetic test, because I find it helpful. So I don't do it for everybody, but um, sometimes it's, it's useful. And these are the classic celiac manifestations. I never see this. I mean, sometimes you get you know, diarrhea, weight loss, malnutrition, and malabsorption. Um, these are the classic symptoms, but more, more common, um, you know, I'm seeing the extra intestinal symptoms and that's triggering um, you know, the um, testing for me. So you can see it runs the gamut from iron, iron deficiency, anemia, to fatigue, to delayed puberty, no periods, early menopause. Um, you know, I would say, I would, I would add in there hair loss. Um, you know, I see that. I've seen that a couple, you know, at least a couple times. Um, and um, it, like I said, any autoimmune condition, I will test, you know, so type 1 diabetes or thyroid, you know, just to rule it out. And then the other important thing, and this is not just from celiac, but from, you know, for leaky gut in general, um, if you lose the structure of the intestinal um, lining, um, in particular, worse, more so with celiac, but you can get lots of micronutrient deficiencies, which increases the inflammation in the system overall. So anyone who has a gut issue, be it something severe like celiac, or you know, leaky gut or increase intestinal permeability if the absorption um, and the function of the gut lining isn't as good, um, that also sets the stage for systemic inflammation because deficiencies in these things um, can, can um, add to that. So there's many, 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 many people <laughs> who have symptoms relating, like an immune reaction to gluten, but are, test negative for non-celiac. Well, they test negative for celiac disease, but yet they have a reaction to gluten. Um, and sometimes I find that um, it, the symptoms are almost identical, but then when we do the test, it's negative. So there is a syndrome that is characterized as non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And what I would say is that in my experience with gastroenterologists, um, some are completely on board with this and you know recognize it as a thing <laughs> and then some do not you know but if the world's expert on gluten related disorders feels like it's a thing then you know i i believe him <laughs> and and i've seen it with my own eyes um you know, so, so it's really hard for me, you know, to have somebody who has a bona fide reaction to um, gluten who tests negative, you know, on their, their celiac testing. Um, you know, I definitely feel like, you know, it still could be an immune reaction. Um, so this non-celiac gluten sensitivity is characterized by basically you have to remove the gluten for at least seven days and then reintroduce it preferably blindly you know but and you know that's really hard to do so typically we, we have an open reintroduction meaning the person knows that they're reintroducing um, wheat or gluten and then we see um, so I usually will remove it for three weeks and then reintroduction after the symptom resolution um, is ruled out so so typically for this non-celiac gluten sensitivity, the symptoms can be identical. So, you know, that, that chart I showed you before, you know, with all of these symptoms, you know, I, I often will think, could, could gluten still be an issue even if they test negative for celiac? And so the other thing that I sometimes will see, like so abdominal pain, bloating, diarrhea, joint pain, um, inflammatory conditions, headaches, and skin. Um, you cannot distinguish celiac from non-celiac gluten sensitivity based on symptoms alone. You need blood testing. And you know this is a, definitely a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, we have to rule out wheat allergy. We have to rule out celiac. And then you know if the person says, you know, yes, my you know um, symptoms go away, and then when I eat gluten again, they come back. <laughs> you know, I you know I believe them, and and I do feel like it can be this non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, 
sometimes if we test for the gliadin, which is another um, protein in wheat, we will see um, a positive in up to 50%. So there are some fancier tests that can be done in non-celiac gluten sensitive patients um, that can be helpful. And then there's even fancier tests that are out now um, through one of the labs that I use that look at even more of the wheat peptides. So they don't just stop at gluten. Remember I said gluten is the most famous protein in wheat, but there's a whole host of others. Um, and so, so there's a lab that will test for most of them that we know at least. Um, and then the risk for non-celiac gluten sensitivity is slightly higher in people who carry the gene for celiac disease. Um, so remember like you can have the gene for celiac disease, but it's the combination of environmental factors and, um, and then the trigger of the wheat that allows for that gene to express. It's not 100% penetrance, meaning you can have the gene your whole life and never get celiac. But you, you are more likely, a little bit more likely, to have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which was one of the questions earlier. So the non-celiac gluten sensitivity, it's, it's um, argued, is it immune mediated or non-immune mediated? Um, and I, th I definitely think that, you know, I personally think it's more immune mediated, um, you know, but some other explanations that have been speculated that, you know, wheat just has other sugars in it. So maybe it's a metabolism issue. You know, I definitely, definitely think that it's a gut permeability issue, um, which, you know, to me is an immune system issue as well. Um, and then, of course, we talked about how the wheat of today is different than the wheat of yesterday. The glyphosate issue, which is that Roundup that's sprayed on the, on the conventionally farmed wheat. Um, and, you know, it's interesting, like I've had occasionally a patient like who's gone to Europe and has said, oh, you know, like when I was in Europe, I ate Ate, you know bread you know in Italy and you know other places and I didn't react like I react to the to the um, to the bread here and so I you know I often wonder you know maybe that there is something to be said for how much gluten is in our you know hybridized wheat in America and then the glyphosate thing because like the, um, in Europe I don't believe that they um, use glyphosate and then there could be an immune response to another component of the wheat. Um, and so, like I mentioned, there's other peptides in wheat other than gluten. Gluten's the most famous, but we can test for other ones. And maybe the person's reacting to something else in, in wheat. Um, this was that same diagram with the gluten. Um, and then I just, I'm going to stop for a second, and then I'll just see if there's some questions. Um, I have the celiac gene and developed what I thought was gluten sensitivity, so stopped eating gluten because of this I can't get the standard celiac testing. Can I assume that I have celiac and should I avoid all potential gluten foods as if I'm celiac? Um, I would say that it's very likely or possible that, that you have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, if you never had testing when you were eating gluten for the antibodies, you know, you can never be 100% certain of that. But, you know, I would say if you have the gene, you are more likely to be sensitive. And then if every time you eat it, you have symptoms, you know, you, 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 know, you have at least non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Um, with full-blown celiac disease, the autoimmune reaction, you know, the longer you're off gluten, the more normalized your gut lining will become <laughs> because the attack is not happening, you know, on, on that consistent basis. And so typically I, if I have somebody with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, I tell them to avoid gluten. Absolutely, like, like, like they have celiac. Um, because what I have seen is the symptoms are identical. And um, I have some autoimmune patients in my practice who like I, I'm convinced <laughs> that even though their celiac test has been negative, it's their trigger, you know, for their immune system. And, and you know, maybe it's not so bad that, that they have the atrophy of the gut lining, um, you know, but it, the symptoms are the same and the inflammation in your body is the same. Okay, I'm gonna share screen unless there's any other questions. Okay. 
So I'm just going to go over um, just a case study. Um, I've changed the name of this person and I got her permission um, and I you know, changed some of the specifics of the case so that it's totally unidentifiable. But what I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, this case that she basically came in, we'll call her Mary. She was 66. Um, she had a known history of autoimmune called Sjogren's osteoarthritis, and her main complaint was fatigue. She was on a host of medicines, and the specifics of those aren't important. Just some of them are for chronic pain, for thyroid, and for sleep, and for headaches. And she was on also chronic antibiotics um, because of frequent urinary infections. And what's interesting is she put herself on AIP diet, so autoimmune paleo diet which removes gluten, dairy, corn, soy, peanuts, eggs, shellfish, then also includes um, beans, nuts and seeds. Um, so it's a very restrictive diet and, an, and an, um, it takes out nightshades as well. Almost forgot the nightshades. Um, and, and this was just not sustainable. But what's interesting is improvement of her joint pain and her dry mouth. And she just didn't know what to do because she felt like she had to choose between eating normally um, and the, um, her symptoms. And so I just, you know, AIP, I just wrote out what that is. Um, and then every time she added back those foods, she got a return of her symptoms. So everybody that I see gets a timeline. <laughs> and so this is a timeline of your health and your conditions um, because sometimes that leads to clues as to why something is happening. And so I typically will you know, put together you know, the symptoms and the current conditions in the bottom here, their age when, they come, when the person comes in, and then all the things that kind of led up to that. And in her case, you know, I felt like, you know, menopause was a big trigger for her symptoms, frequent antibiotics um, with the urinary infections. Um, and then, you know, growing up, like she had no allergies to foods or anything, but she did have exposure to um, smoke, you know, tobacco. And then she had a lot, a lot, a lot of metal, metal fillings as well and then used quite a bit of anti-inflammatory medicines, NSAIDs like ibuprofen throughout um, her life. Um, and so I, you know, those were some of the triggers I felt, I felt like were a factor for her current um, symptoms. And she scored 109 on my symptom score. <laughs> so normally I like to see people less than 30 on my symptom score and she scored 109. So could it be all those foods? <laughs> so I hope not, and she hoped not. Um, and really what I think was happening was a loss of her immune system tolerance for a lot of the reasons that we talked about with leaky gut. You know, so sometimes it's not, not the food itself, but it's really the immune system and the immune system overreacting to foods in part due to leaky gut and then in part do, you know, sometimes when there's immune system inflammation and the, the load is so great, you know, so the either um, because of um, pathogens like Lyme or um, toxins like mercury or um, mold, um, sometimes the burden on the immune system is so great that the person has trouble clearing or um, the cleanup crew has trouble cleaning up the inflammatory response as a result of that um, immune system irritation. And food can just be part of that, but it's a bigger immune picture. So pretty much what I did is um, we focused, we, we actually focused mostly on her gut health, her immune system and her hormones. Um, we tested gut bacteria. So remember how we talked about the gut bacteria and how that can influence um, you know, the gut barrier and the immune system. Um, and then we put together the gut repair plan based on that and some things that kind of help heal the gut lining like fish oil and glutamine and zinc and probiotics. And then we treated her unfriendly bacteria that she had on her test with herbal antibiotics. Um, and in this case, 
um, she also happened to have some um, unfriendly bacteria in the small intestines. So she had what's called SIBO, um, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And that was determined on a breath test. Um, so, so she had a stool test and a breath test. Um, she wasn't absorbing her food very well, so we used enzymes. And then we worked on her nervous system because stress was an issue. Um, and that was, um, we did osteopathic treatment for that. And then we balanced the hormones, mostly the stress hormone and the thyroid and a little bit of the sex hormones. And we also added something called LDN, which helps the immune system kind of balance out a little bit. Um, and then she improved. Um, and we added the food, some foods back in. And you know what I would describe is that she's still on a reduced carb whole foods diet, very healthy diet. Um, but we were able to get her off some of her medications and we were able to get her symptom score down from 109 to 28, which was great. Um, and then, you know, and this is what I hope for everybody because, you know, it's so hard and I understand that. And, you know, I struggle with it too. Um, you know, it's really hard to stay on a healthy diet all the time. <laughs> and so I really, um, you know, I, I hope, and I hope for her, and, and this is what happened, is that, you know, if you eat well, like 90% of the time, you know, the 10% doesn't matter. And you're able to kind of go out and, you know, go to Disney World or, you know, go, go to um, places now and again and, and eat foods that, you know, are probably not the best for you, you know, but have the reserve that you can be okay afterward and not have a flare of your joint pain or of your other autoimmune symptoms. And so that's always, you know, what I, what I hope for um, in cases like that. And, you know, that's, the treatment is never the same for, for every person, you know, and that was what happened in her case. But, you know, sometimes we're looking at, you know, mold, um, toxins and detoxing that or heavy metals or other things that, you know, just reducing the burden the immune system has to deal with. And, and again, food can just be one small part of that burden, you know, but every little bit makes a difference. So sometimes food is a trigger or a contributing factor for the immune system and pesky symptoms and diagnoses. Um, and then there's a spectrum of the immune response to food, especially gluten. So the, point, the, the dose is the poison sometimes. <laughs> and you know, so sometimes if you eat a ton of a food that you might be sensitive to, that's different than having a little bit of a contaminant you know, for some people. For some patients, especially those with um, celiac, and then I would probably classify some patients with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, a little bit is not okay. <laughs> um, and that can be um, not great for your for immune system. And then elimination diet and testing can be very helpful to tease this out. And I also want to say, just like in the case I showed you, it's not always the food. It's how the food is interacting with the biology, the intestinal permeability, and the immune system's loss of tolerance. So, you know, it's really, um, you know, occasionally I'll have somebody who has a true primary, you know, food sensitivity issue, you know, and like, for example, for my celiac patients, I mean, you know, you remove gluten and they're like, wow, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like a home run. Um, and that's not always the case, you know, but I would say, um, you know, more often than not, it's, it's really just, you know, a sm um, another factor for the immune system. So I, I guess what I'd like for you to do is just ask yourself, can a food reaction be contributing to my current state of health, you know, given everything I said about, you know, IgE, non-IgE, reactions, um, food sensitivities, and, and whatnot. Here's my contact information, and I will break for questions. I have a whole bunch of references on here, but 